We begin in Ukraine. Eight civilians, including two children, were killed on Sunday as they tried to flee the city of Kyiv. A local mayor says that they were among a group of evacuees who were crossing a bridge when Russian forces opened fire. Meanwhile, a second evacuation effort to get Ukrainians out of the city of Mariupol failed Sunday morning. Ukraine says Russian forces started shelling during a ceasefire, preventing an estimated 200,000 people from leaving the city. Ukrainian authorities say Russian forces launched a similar attack during a ceasefire on Saturday. And in Ukraine's capital, another sign of the country's resilience. Video out of Kyiv shows hundreds of men lining up to join the Ukrainian armed forces. CBS News foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett has more from Kyiv. Residents in the besieged city of Mariupol have withstood some of the heaviest shelling from the Russian military since this invasion began. <laughs> Doctors Without Borders describes the humanitarian crisis as catastrophic and that civilians are in desperate need. The city's hospital is overwhelmed. A man rushes in, clutching his 18-month-old son wounded in shelling. Doctors try frantically to revive the little boy, but they're unable to save him. His mother breaks down in tears. Elsewhere, the brutal onslaught has only intensified, destroying everything in its path. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today warned that Russia is now planning to bombard the port city of Odessa while renewing the plea for a no-fly zone. Countered by President Putin's warning to the West that any country declaring a no-fly zone would be seen as an enemy combatant. With Moscow now banning all media coverage of the war in Ukraine, Visa and MasterCard have now joined the growing number of international companies suspending operations in that country. Even as Russian troops close in on major cities, Ukrainian forces continue to put up a fierce resistance claiming to have downed a Russian fighter jet and the defense ministry distributing video of a Russian attack helicopter shot out of the sky. Even in occupied cities like Kherson, anti-Russian protests and demonstrations are already underway. Residents confronting armed Russian soldiers. And yet, the more determined the resistance, the more devastating the Russian military's response. Joining me now from Ukraine is CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay. Chris, welcome. I understand that you are now in the city of Vinnytsia, uh, and Russian missiles have destroyed the local airport there. Tell us what you're seeing on the ground. Well, what we saw and what we've been seeing is people fleeing this city uh, by the car load. On our way here, there were just massive amounts of cars taking over not just their own lanes, but our lanes as well, driving the wrong way in traffic in their eagerness to flee this city. And this was even before we knew that the airport had been attacked. In fact, that was why they were fleeing. And it turns out that eight rockets landed on the airport and, according to the Ukrainian president, completely destroyed it. In fact, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky said it served absolutely no military purpose whatsoever and, once again, condemned Russia for attacking its infrastructure and used it as an opportunity to also condemn NATO for deciding to not enforce a no-fly zone over Ukrainian skies, saying that, indeed, NATO, it turns out, wants uh, Ukrainians to die just a very slow death. I'm paraphrasing oh. there, but this is not the first time he's come out strong against NATO for deciding not to enforce that no-fly zone. Uh, those are some harsh, that's a harsh sentiment. Um, let's talk, Chris, about the United Nations reports that more than 360 civilians have been killed in Ukraine. Uh, we also understand that the number could actually be much higher than that. Meanwhile, we hear that there are Russian losses of about 10,000, uh, but we should know that those numbers are coming from Ukrainian authorities and we have not been able to independently verify them. How should we be interpreting these numbers, Chris? Well, to verify these numbers in the thick of war, in the fog of war, is virtually impossible, especially when a general rule of thumb in all wars is that 
both sides start lying. However, there is an abundance of anecdotal evidence to at least support the claim that Russian forces are suffering immense setbacks. There is no shortage of, of, of witnesses who have apprehended Russian soldiers, Russian pilots who have been shot out of the sky, captured by regular civilians, regular army. These types of videos are, are all over social media. But of course, you have to take into consideration that it's hard to verify a lot of these, these videos. So at the end of the day, it's, it's very hard to tell. But one thing is for sure, when it comes to the media war that's taking place, using these videos, using footage of you know Russian jets crashing to the ground, uh, Ukraine is winning that media war. It, it has clearly won the hearts and minds of people all over the world who are now cheering for a country, many of whom had perhaps never been able to locate on, on a map until now. And though it is important to note, obviously, that those images are being seen by people outside of Russia, Russian state media really having full control and, and censorship um, of, of the message that Russians are receiving. Chris, I want to go back to something that you said, though, about there was no there was no military reason to hit the airport, that it served no military purpose. Why why is Vladimir Putin apparently so determined to to control Ukraine, get rid of a Ukraine that is uh, that's independent from Russia? Well, let's start with the reasons he's stated that he wants to have this war. I mean, he says that he wants to denazify Ukraine. I mean, that on its face should come across as 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 puzzling, if not ludicrous, when you take into consideration that Ukraine's president uh, is Jewish. Uh, is Jewish. Also, when you take into consideration that. Yes, he's Jewish. Uh, you know, uh, when you take into consideration that, you know, like virtually all democracies, uh, Ukraine does have a far right element to it, but it only occupies 2% of seats in parliament, which is actually extremely low uh, compared to most other Western democ democracies. Uh, his, his other stated purpose for uh, invading Ukraine is to protect its Russian speaking population. Again, this becomes more and more incoherent with every bomb that lands in Ukraine, especially when bombs are landing in cities like Kharkiv, which are very close to the border of Russia and are majority Russian speaking. So in order to protect the Russian speaking population, the logic goes, he has to now kill the Russian speakers. And he's doing it brutally in towns, in cities like Kharkiv, which by all accounts, have are, has already been conquered, but they continue to barrage the city uh, to kill civilians. It, it, it makes absolutely no sense. So uh, if you want to understand the real reason why Vladimir Putin is attacking Ukraine, uh, most experts believe it has to do with the fact that Ukraine is a democracy. It's a flawed democracy by, by all accounts. I mean, it, it's, it's had problems with corruption over years. It's, it's absolutely not perfect, but it's been going in the right direction, and it did so so with a lot of popular demonstrations to remove its corrupt leaders in the past, this is the kind of thing that Vladimir Putin does not want to see happening on his doorstep. This is, a, again, it's a Russian-speaking country. It's Ukrainian-speaking, but it's also a Russian-speaking country. Uh, and it's very easy for Russian citizens to look across the border and see what their neighbors are achieving and start to think, perhaps, wouldn't it be nice if we could have elections every few years and start to elect our own leaders? That's the last thing that Vladimir Putin wants. So for him, uh, he cannot tolerate. I mean, the very fact that Ukraine exists as a democratic country is a direct threat to his leadership. Chris, I want to loop back to NATO and talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we heard Secretary Blinken saying on Sunday that NATO members now have the green light to begin uh, to send fighter jets over to Ukraine. Tell us about the importance of that decision. Well, it would give Ukraine more of a fighting chance. As I mentioned, they do not currently operate under a no-fly zone. So their biggest enemy right now is the sky, you know, having to deflect uh, missiles and rockets and not to mention, you know, planes that are that are dropping bombs on, on their cities. So to reinforce their air force would allow them to stand up to Russia even more. So it'd be a huge turning point short of actually having other forces, Western forces, NATO forces cross the border into Ukraine and fight on their behalf. Of course, that's a red line that NATO has insisted it will not cross because it would bring NATO forces into direct altercation with Russia, which could spark a much bigger conflict. All right. Chris Livesay in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you.